look at us. Here we are, episode two of the All 32 podcast. They said it couldn't be done. I don't know who they are. I don't know that they said that, but that's what I'm going to go with. Mike Giardi here, Will Parkinson, my co-host on the program. Will, excited to do this. Like, you know, we're getting closer and closer. We actually have preseason football. You may listen to this on Thursday, and there will be preseason football. Like, I know we had the one Hall of Fame game, but, like, everybody's getting into the rhythm now. Yeah, no, now we're we're locked and loaded, ready to go. Teams are on full pads, inner squad scrimmages, fights, <laughs> yes. real games, the whole nine yards. We're gonna start to see some of this rookie class playing, you know, playing quarterback and a bunch of these different things. So finally some exciting times in football to actually break down here and not just speculate on a bunch of other things going on in the offseason. Yeah, somebody should tell the Lions and the Giants when you have your helmets on and you throw punches, that's just a bad idea. Uh I wanna remind you, obviously, this show is brought to you by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network and Game Time. That's the best tickets, best prices to get you in to see any event you ever want to see. Look, I use them. They're, they're great. Yeah, I know you use them as well. Like you want to go to a Sox game, you want to go to a Yankees game, you're out of time, you, something you want to do, that's the place to go and do that. Um, look, there, there's a lot of stuff that I want to get into today. We're going to preview the AFC West as we start to break down each division as we get closer and closer to the regular season. But obviously we have to kind of start with the news of the last 24 to 48 hours and that's Brandon Ayuk. Is he staying? Is he going? Obviously, based here just outside of Foxborough. And uh, they had a deal worked out, at least in terms of with the San Francisco 49ers. Compensation was worked out. And then guess what Brandon Ayuk said to them? Eh, I don't think so. I don't think I'm all that interested in coming to a team. And what I would say to that is he's like the rest of us. Uh, he actually might be worse than us because he's on the phone a lot. But he has the Internet. So you say, oh, do I want to go play for the Patriots? Let me Google the Patriots. What thing, what's going on here in the summertime? Oh, Drake May looks a little bit rugged here. It's a raw prospect. He's only 21 years old. It's Jacoby Brissett. Who are the other guys in the receiver room with me? Uh, maybe not. Maybe this isn't a place for me. And clearly, though, all along, I feel like, and I, I'm curious to hear your take, Will, is that he's steering this in a certain direction. And that's clearly Pittsburgh. And whether or not they get a deal done, I mean, there may be by the time you listen to it, mind you, we're recording this on a Wednesday afternoon, that that could happen. But if it doesn't, and he wants to go in that direction, does it make a difference for the Pittsburgh Steelers where they're at right now? Yeah, a couple of things there. I think I mentioned Brandon Ayuk as a trade candidate back in like January where Jets fans were like, hey, what's the big move this offseason? I was like, I don't think he's going to get moved, but hey, you never know. Like Brandon Ayuk, it kind of times up where like they can't pay everybody. He's going to want a big deal, all this different stuff. And they just paid Debo, which I'm sure they regret paying Debo mm. over Ayuk. In hindsight, a couple of different things. One, we saw something, you know, he kind of has a quasi no trade clause in a sense where if he doesn't, you know, we see, we see this with New England, obviously, as you mentioned, agreed upon trade terms. Couldn't, you know, the number for the contract potentially looks good, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily want to go to New England. So that's obviously why they've, you know, quote unquote, stopped pursuing him, et cetera. Um, it's something that was, it's kind of interesting because it's a trade. I, I think we go back to off seasons when we talk about Lamar Jackson and how teams did not want to give parameters for a contract for Lamar because anyway, it wasn't going anywhere. This time, I think there was a chance he could go somewhere. So teams were more willing to do that. It seems like, New England probably kind of gave the numbers in which they're going to ask for, you know, from Pittsburgh. And I guess that's kind of really the hold up there. It seems like it's that. And is it a two and a four or is it a two and a five and a player? There's some, you know, differing reports depending on, you know, who you talk to, but Ayuk's an awesome player. He's probably a borderline, if not already a top 10 receiver in the league, he's age 26 season, all these different things like awesome player would be awesome on any team. My only reservation of the three teams that it seemed like were the most interested, Cleveland, uh, although I feel like Cleveland was kind of getting used as a little bit of leverage there for, for Pittsburgh, New England, where I thought it was a viable destination. We've talked about it for a long time. We both kind of thought next year was probably the year for, to make the IU move, similar to year two, Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen. And then there's Pittsburgh and great coach, good, not great roster in my opinion. And we'll get to them when we do the AFC North. I don't know that they have a quarterback and actually mm. I'm pretty positive they don't. Yeah. And it's great that they have Najee and, and, you know, and Pickens and all these different guys, fire Muth and stuff. I, is Brandon Ayuk taking them from like an eight or nine win, although be a nine win team. Cause it's Mike Tomlin to an 11 or 12 win team in a division. They still might be the fourth best team in. Yeah. That's a little bit of my concern of like, it's a fun move. It's exciting. And maybe it helps fields or, um, 
you know, maybe it helps Russell Wilson, but like those guys have played with a lot of great receivers and we haven't seen a lot of wins. So I'm just not totally sold on the move as a whole for the, where he's going. Well, there, there are folks who cover the new England Patriots who um, said publicly this week that they thought if the Patriots got Ayuk, they become a real playoff contender. Now look, Vegas sets a number because they're trying to win money, right? They're trying to generate action, but the over under was four and a half for the new England Patriots. And I think, Right now, if you said, Mike, if you had to put a number on it, I would say six. I would say six wins is where I would kind of see them right now. And we'll see development. But obviously, Barmore probably out for the season. If not, certainly out for a good portion of the season. The Judon thing continues to linger, you know, like a bad fart. You know, he didn't practice the other day. Like, I, I just I can't believe that that situation hasn't been settled. But there's no way that Brandon Ayuk, one receiver, and I believe a good one, a very good one, a top 10 receiver, pushes them from six wins to nine wins, seven wins to if you're on the high end of that. Like it just, there's no way they're just, first of all, they're not good enough up front, which is going to be a massive problem for them all year. Um, and they still haven't hammered out the lineup there. They've had some injuries up on the front line thus far, and it's not helping them gain some cohesion there. But just look, again, they're in a transitional period. The roster was broken down by Bill Belichick. they Not nearly enough good players on the roster. Some young players that people are expecting to take big leaps. Christian Gonzalez being one of them, but he's played three-plus games in the NFL. Like You just you see potential there, but we don't know exactly what he is just yet. So the idea that Ayuk would take them over the hump is ludicrous. The other thing that I think is interesting, they've been pursuing him since before the draft, right? When it was clear things weren't going well with San Francisco, he's obviously been very vocal, Will, on social media, dating back to the actual night of the Super Bowl or the morning after the Super Bowl about not getting enough targets and how can that happen? And this is probably it for me. I think it was his brother who started that whole or one of his close friends, but like he didn't do anything to dispel that. Uh, and obviously has been at various points active on social media, spouting about this, that, and the other thing about where things are going with San Francisco and not feeling like he's wanted there. But the Patriots have had interest. They had the offer on the table before the draft. They continue to stay in touch. Elliot Wolf doing his due diligence. He wanted to weaponize the offense. Obviously, it didn't quite work out that way in terms of some of the veteran guys that maybe could have come here during free agency, but they do double dip in the draft at wide receiver. Polk in the second round, Javon Baker in the fourth. They draft Drake May knowing it's a project, but hopefully at some point, I'm, I'm sure at some point he'll be playing this year, but still, missing that big piece, the guy that sort of alters defenses, which they don't they don't have that guy. They haven't had that guy for a long time now, probably since Gronk was uh, in his heyday, maybe Edelman if you want to, even though it's a slot, like that's where Brady would always go. So, okay, it's going to make them better, but how much better? And then to dole out a contract, which I know uh, ESPN reported the average annual value is going to be in the top five at the position, which to me is fine. Like whether you think he's a top five or not, the cap keeps going up, right? Guys keep getting ridiculous deal after ridiculous deal. In two years, you'll look at that contract if you gave him $30 million per year and say, oh, it's, well, now it's like the 14th best contract. That's just the way it works. I don't get too stressed about that. What's interesting to me, though, Will, is we didn't hear a guaranteed number, and I've been trying to figure that guaranteed number out because that's the one that matters the most, and I haven't gotten a good answer on that, a solid answer. And to me, that reeks of maybe some – uh, let's say some accounting, uh, whatever you're, you're kind of fudging the accounting a little bit. Hey, look, we're going to give you a five-year deal for 150 million. Okay. That's great. But wh where's the real money? How much money is in the first two years? Can you walk away from me at some point in year three or year four and the back half of that contract, which is stacked for whatever $90 million. I never see, um, you know, Justin Jefferson got 87 million guaranteed, I think. What did Tyreek Hill get? 54, I believe. So big gap between those two. CeeDee Lamb and Jamar Chase still out there, still haven't got their new deals done. But you know when they do, they're going to be pushing somewhere in that range. Were they really willing to go that far? And would it even matter? Sort of like the Calvin Ridley situation in free agency, right, where they went far with him. They thought they – and they finally drew a line. But then when you hear Ridley talk about it afterwards – Probably wasn't coming here. He's probably using that number to go to Tennessee or whoever else was in the mix, Jacksonville, and say, hey, fellas, New England's willing to pay me $40 million guaranteed. What are you going to do for me, right? And Ridley ended up getting $48, 50000000 million guaranteed essentially over two years. And I just wonder if Ayuk is just doing that same thing. Like, hey, thanks, guys, but 
I don't really mean it. I don't really want to go there. To your point, I just want to take this contract to Pittsburgh or even take it back to San Francisco, where I'm not totally certain that he wants to leave and say, can you do can you can you get somewhere close to this? Can we do something about that? Yeah, look, I think the one other example that kind of comes to mind is Tyreek Hill. When he got moved the first time, you know, it was the Jets and the Dolphins and the Jets were not. They were in that position where they were kind of doing what the Patriots were trying to do. They were probably a little further along um, in terms of what that, you know, what the class was going to end up looking like, um, you know, in 2022. But, you know, obviously in hindsight, but, you know, the Jets had four, ten, uh, you know, 35 and 38 or whatever it was. Obviously, they end up with this generational class and, you know, Garrett and Sauce and Brees and all these guys and Jermaine. But Tyreek Hill seemed like he never was really going to the Jets. And the Jets were involved and they kind of gave the parameters for what a deal was going to end up looking like. And it kind of feels like the Patriots were put in that same spot where, again, maybe in 12 months now, Mayo looks like an up and coming coach and he he's solidified who he's going to be. Um, the Patriots have figured out Drake May has got all his talent and, hey, he looks he looks good enough or we're, we're pretty confident going into year two. I mentioned part of the reason for wanting to trade Judon in the last episode was that this team is a year away from being a year away. Yes. And I just – you wonder again, does IU, it makes a ton of sense for the Patriots. Does it make a ton of sense? Again, they've been aggressive in the receiver market. Does it make, did it make sense for IU? And it it seems like it didn't. Um, And again, things could change and maybe Pittsburgh says, you know what, actually we're out of here, but Mike Tomlin seemed quite confident this morning and and talking about IU and there's almost too much smoke, whether it's pretty Ricky or any of these other guys on Twitter or, you know, it's Rappaport and Schefter and and all the rest. Uh, The one question, I guess I kind of want to, transition this and we can start talking a little AFC West here is does we kind of talk you touched on I touched on a little bit but does this make the Steelers competitive with the Chiefs of the world I don't want to start with the Chiefs but is this like can this raise them to that level or are they still probably playing the pool over the teams we're going to talk about first in that Chargers maybe Raiders kind of realm I think you hit the nail on the head where they could easily make this trade and still end up being the fourth place team in that division. And and they'll be competitive because, as you said, they always are competitive. Mike Tomlin doesn't have a losing season. And certainly having him and Pickens on the field at the same time is frightening. But again, tell me who's throwing him the football. Russell Wilson had numbers last year, but everybody knew that watched him. It wasn't good. He's, he's, he's on the other side. He's been on the other side for a while. He actually got hurt to start training camp. And I know Justin Fields got some run there. They're still listing Wilson as the number one. But Fields has his flaws, obviously. He's never proven to be a good passer in this league. So that's great that you could have Pickens and Ayuk side, you know, on each side. But if the guy can't get it to him, we know Pickens is a volatile character. (laughs) We've seen that so far, which is one of the reasons he didn't go in the first round to begin with. And Ayuk has obviously proven to be, and I'm not this isn't I'm not saying he's a bad guy. Don't don't know that or not. I'm just saying he's very vocal about touches and the football and his money. So okay, he gets his money, but then because you empowered him with 30 million plus a year or whatever it's going to be, does then that turn him into one of the most powerful guys in your entire organization, more powerful than even the quarterback. And how do they deal with that? Like it's, it's a risky thing. Like it'd be one thing again, if you're putting him in, inserting him into an offense that has a established presence at head coach, which Tomlin is, but an established presence and a player, a good player at this point at quarterback pick, Pick one of the great teams, like, you know, like have that that consistent guy at quarterback. If you went to the Jets, Aaron Rodgers, like the pecking order is simple. It's Aaron's team, you know, and you have to fall in line. He comes to a place like Pittsburgh where it's Tomlin's team. But in terms of the locker room, eh, Wilson, eh, Fields, like what's going to happen there? I, I just I can't see it making a massive difference for them. Um and again, I, like I said, I, I still wonder if in his heart of hearts, he knows he's in the best situation possible and he's just trying to wrangle more money out of San Francisco or get more of a commitment from them. We'll see, because I mean, clearly San Francisco is frustrated with the whole thing, which I think is why all this information eventually got leaked out. Um, you tease the uh, AFC West. Let's get to that. But first, let's take a quick break. Will, you love in the summertime. I know you. You love to go to Yankees games. I'm not going to hold it against you. It's a nice park. Uh, the team I can live without, but whatever. You're that guy. Who do you use? Do you use anybody in particular when you when you need your tickets and you want to find that best seat? Maybe the day of. You're like, oh, man, I got time. I'm going to go to a game time. It's beautiful out. Me and the girl, we're going to go to the game. No, for me right now, it's game time app. It's uh, it's 
it's incredibly easy to use, incredibly efficient. You find some of the best seats and some of the best deals, you know, on the market for whether you're going to Yankees, Red Sox, or, or any type of sport. Yeah, it's funny. My daughter keeps saying, when are we going to a game? When are we going to a game? I'm like, well, let me get the app. We put the app. We go, bam, we're done. It's so simple. It's so easy. The interface is just fantastic. You want to use that. Game time. Dot co last minute deals save up to 60 percent off buying last minute for sports concerts comedy theater whatever you need game time's got it take the guesswork out of buying mlb tickets this season with game time download the game time app create an account and use the code clns for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code clns for 20 dollars off download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed all right, Will, uh, we look at the divisions. We start with the AFC West, where there is the defending Super Bowl champ, the reigning Super Bowl, two-time Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs, but we're going to save them for last. want to start with the Las Vegas Raiders. And initially, when we talked about doing this, and I'm like, all right, so let's start diving into these teams. And my first blush at the roster is, God, they could be one of the worst teams in football this year. <laughs> then you dig a little bit deeper, and, you know, I love the acquisition of Christian Wilkins, the idea of him and Max Crosby on that defensive line, like, okay, maybe there's a little bit more talent than I'm giving them credit for defensively. Um, but I, I, you got to go with the position that means the most in the National Football League, and that's quarterback, where they gave a lot of money to Gardner Minshew. And Gardner Minshew is fine. <laughs> you know, 30th quarterback in the league, 32nd quarterback, whatever you want to – we're going to put him, but, like, you're not – I don't think you're winning anything with Gardner Minshew. Obviously, a character guy, you know, funny guy. Uh, fans seem to love him. Teammates kind of gravitate towards him, but he's very limited athletically with his arm. Uh, and that obviously, I think, has posed problems wherever he's been. And then the guy that ended up taking over for Jimmy Garoppolo last year when Antonio Pierce became the head coach is Aiden O'Connell. And he was probably better as a rookie than I maybe initially thought as I looked deeper into some of the numbers. But there's also a limitation. Like, if he might be like a skosh above what Gardner Minshew is, just not the same athlete as Gardner. So I, I don't know what that does for a team, even if your defense becomes a top 10 defense. Yeah, a couple of things, uh, you know, stand out with the Raiders. Um, somewhat similar and very different because of the coach and some of the star power. Um, I guess, you know, kind of somewhat similar, I guess, in, in a lot of ways. Quarterback is a huge issue. It's a quarterback league. They have far and away at least the third, if not the, you know, the second, you know, the worst quarterback room in, in the division. Probably yeah. slightly better than Denver, which we'll talk about, and, and my old friend Zach Wilson. But, <laughs> you know, I, look, I you look it up and down the roster, right? Devontae, I guess I'll just start with Devontae here. We've talked about him a lot last episode, so I don't want to talk. I don't want to spend 10 minutes talking about how Devontae is going to get traded. I it feels already like I've, I've asked some Raiders people and, you know, you followed on Twitter and the beat writers and everything like that. And Sean Reed tweeted pretty perfectly. I thought summed up what Devonte has been like with the Raiders. And it said, how's Devonte looked during camp? And it was mm. non-existent and it's not his fault, yeah. which means the quarterback play is obviously still an issue. Um, so starting, obviously we'll start with a the negative there. They lost some folks on the offensive line. They did ask, add Jackson Paris Johnson, who I loved in the draft. He's still on pup though. And again, a rookie coming in, he's a guard slash center, uh, you know, like right now he's slotted in to play guard, but you know, we'll see there. You do get excited though. When you look at the Raiders and you see Devante, Jacoby Myers, Max, Ma Max Mayer, and uh, you know, and, and obviously, Brock Bowers, yeah. and obviously Brock Bowers, right? And and Brock is and Michael Mayer. So I don't want to say Max Mayer. I thought Max Crosby <laughs> in my head. Uh, you know, Mayer and Mayer and Bowers. You can line them up in a ton of twelve personnel. They can be a heavy power run team, and you know, play action stuff and get Bowers and great matchups and all that stuff. I think that's the future of what this team's going to be in, under Antonio Pierce, and that's great to see. I think that's a nice foundation. Power Johnson in the run game is going to be able to move some bodies. He's super athletic. Can you get him out in space? And, and then obviously, again, play action stuff with Mayer, who's a great blocker as well as a great pass catcher. And then Bowers, obviously, who's by all counts looks awesome during camp. Jacoby Myers, you covered in New England, I think is a really good quality. Yep. High end, middle of tier number two, really high end three. And if he's Absolutely. right now, probably your fourth or fifth option, that's great. The offensive line should be somewhat solid. They were better than I thought last year, mm -hmm. looking back at some of the numbers and some of the tape. My concern is defensively, I don't see it outside of Crosby and, and, and potentially Wilkins. I just don't feel like they're awesome uh, by any means. 
And then I have some co- I have some questions about Antonio Pierce. I, I know it's it's probably not kosher to say it because everyone loves Antonio Pierce and he's a legend in New York and and you know super nice at the combine and talk to these guys. But my fear with interim head coaches is always you get this huge boost and then what happens after that? There's a lot of time that's kind of now passed. Mm-hmm. They beat a lot of really bad football teams last year. They lost a couple of pretty bad games. They beat the Chiefs. I guess it was at Christmas and that was awesome. Yep. They beat. The Jets on primetime had no business winning that game. Uh, they beat the Giants with Daniel Jones' leg exploded. I think they lost to Minnesota three to nothing uh, at home. So I, I say all that to say, like, there is pieces on this roster. If you were playing Madden or you were building a, a five a five aside flag football game with Crosby and Devontae and Bowers and all these guys, you're like, wow, man, Christian Wilkins, great addition. I just I just worry. Do we know enough about the coach? Do we know that they're going to be a well-coached team in a division with Harbaugh and Andy Reid and even Sean Payton, for lack of a better term? He's probably the fourth most accomplished coach by a mile. Uh, And then again, defense, lack of depth potentially, and quarterback makes me feel like the Raiders are probably the second worst team in the division starting the season. And I don't know that if Devontae is not moved and quarterback becomes a bit of an issue, they don't end up finishing like six and 11, seven and 10. Like I think seven and 10 is probably their ceiling, at least, you know, early August here. Yeah. So they were eight and nine last year. And as you mentioned, they got the huge boost when Pierce took over because uh, obviously they hated Josh McDaniels. They're smoking cigars after wins in the locker room. I mean, it was just, uh, and they didn't like Jimmy Garoppolo either. I mean, as, as a player. So they were, there was some freedom there that he gave them. But okay, you kind of open that door, and now what happens now that you're fully in charge? And there's going to be times you're going to have to be tougher on these guys. Can he do that? You know, he he's he's appearing as a guest on Crosby's podcast. It's Crosby's podcast with the head coach. Like, it's just a weird dynamic there, where clearly it feels like Mark Davis, the owner, son of Al, um, but nothing like Al, has put all his chips in the player here and is hoping that Pierce, with his sort of we're going to get back to the Raider way um, is going to somehow elevate them into being something that they haven't been for some time. Now I I was looking at their, I mentioned the quarterbacks, they were 27th in offensive DVOA last year. And with that same similar personnel, right? You mentioned Bear was there and granted he was a rookie, but Devante, obviously Jacoby Myers, they had Josh Jacobs at running back, like very, obviously a very good player, but so weak at quarterback. The offensive line is okay, but again, that's a place where they need to, to strengthen up a little bit. The one, thing I, want, the one thing I wanted to ask, the one thing I wanted to ask you, Tyree Wilson, I've stared at, I've been staring at for <laughs> yes. the last five minutes, and it's just like, I keep coming back to like, we're gonna, I'm sure we'll do this, and I, I, we can go back to, I just, every team has got a guy who you're like, if this guy takes that leap or this guy has a great year when, and he does, he fulfills what you expect they could be a much better team. Like if Tyree Wilson takes this huge step this year and all of a sudden their defensive line and their only thing great about that defense, the defensive line, but it's Wilkins, Crosby and Wilson. And they're like just killing people. Now we start to have a different conversation. Can you grind out eight or nine wins and you make yourself frisky? But if he doesn't do that, now it's like, we're going to double Crosby, double Wilkins. We'll leave a tight end and mayor in and he can chip and be an outlet, Uh, you know, or whatever like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I just, well, and, and they're, and like, they're counting on Jack Jones, who the Patriots draft. And obviously, I mean, there was, we're talking about a five-star player coming out of high school, but then has had all kinds of off field stuff that happened and sort of bounced around a little bit, finished at Arizona state, came to the Patriots, had a decent rookie year, then again, off field stuff. And then last year, like basically talk about wildcat strike. He's like, I'm not, I don't want to play for you guys. I want to go play for Antonio Pierce caused problems in the locker room. They let him go and look, he played well for them. I can't, you can't deny that at all. Although a couple of his best games were, you know, he caught Kansas city when Kansas city, I think right around Christmas was a disaster and didn't really know what was happening, but they're putting a lot on his shoulders. It feels like he's their number one corner and they're going to let him, let him play. We'll see if he's good enough. We'll see if he's mentally strong enough to handle the rigors of, of the pressure that comes with that and the 17 games. And I was going to say, you know, like I looked at their schedule and, and just obviously it's on paper because we, we're still a month away from the start of the season. But you're talking at Baltimore, at the Rams, who I think are going to be a good football team, at Cincinnati, at Miami. And then they play Tampa Bay in December, which, OK, I don't know what Tampa Bay is going to be. I will get to them in a future uh, episode. But at home in December, you're playing in a dome. Now you got to go out to the East Coast and play in, a, in the hot sun in December in Tampa like that's not an easy game. So I kind of looked at their schedule and said, 
it was all, I felt like it was a lot easier last year, and I think they took advantage of a couple of those spots. I feel like there are not very many weaknesses in this schedule, unless you want to talk about what's in the division, which obviously we're, we're, we're talking about now. So I just – I would not be shocked if at the end of the year Pierce is firmly on the hot seat. They're a 4-13, 5-12 team, and we're hearing stories of you know unrest in the locker room and Max Crosby doesn't want to be there anymore. Christian Wilkins is wondering what the hell he did. Guaranteed money is what you did. But like that's that that place wouldn't surprise me at all. I don't see I don't I really don't see an avenue for them being a nine ten win team and being a playoff team. The avenue is literally the only way they're a nine ten win playoff or ten win playoff team, in my opinion, is like they have to stay extremely healthy. Pierce has to take this step as a coach that he's gonna out coach people in games. They're going to have to add scheme and get Aiden O'Connell to take this leap. Is he, you know, to be this Jimmy Garoppolo level of like when he was good level, like, Hey, a bunch of play action. We're going to just dump it off and throw over the middle of the field. And like, we're not going to turn the football over. We're going to beat team 17, 13. I just don't think they're built like that. Like I, I don't. And that's part of the problem. They're kind of this like boomer bust team where it's like the flashy Vegas, you know, type of atmosphere. And I don't think I was trying to, in my head, I'm like, can they be built like the 2022 20, giants, but I don't, I guess, but they're not, in, it's a different right. division. It's a different schedule. And I, it just kind of feels the opposite there. So the other team in this division that I want to get to, unless you have anything else in the Raiders is, nope, is, De- is, is Denver, because I think they're one of the most confusing situations in football. I think they are, you just wonder like, and, I, and I'll let you kind of start with them, but they are in such a different, like buyer's remorse from Russell Wilson and trying <laughs> yes. to dig themselves out and be competitive while not having picks and having a coach that's the highest paid coach, or if not one of the three or four highest paid coaches in the league and this big brand in Denver, and they've, they've won for a long time. They were awesome for a really long time. And then now it's like, Hey, we don't really have any draft picks or cap space. The roster is probably like two and a half years past where it was supposed to be good. Mm -hmm. And we just drafted this quarterback who I'm not so sure is going to be very good. So I guess I know it sounds really negative, but where do you, where do you even start with Denver outside of, the quarterback room and the head coach who hasn't been really a contending level coach since yeah. the PI been, game in New Orleans. Yeah, it's been it's been a little bit. Um, yeah, you wonder if he has a little remorse in going there. Although, again, same thing. The paycheck was incredible. So, uh, and the power that he has there, uh, you know, hard to say no to. I, I think it's interesting. I give them credit last year because obviously we saw how bad it was in the beginning of the season. They started the year one and five. We, of course, remember the 70-plus point game or 70, whatever it was, 72-70 against Miami that hung with them for a little while. I think they were trying to meld some systems together, and I think they did a good job sort of recalibrating after that defensively and figuring that part of it out to a certain degree. So I don't expect that they're going to be that deficient or start that poorly uh, defensively this year. And I think you've seen a reaction to that as well and how they've had, you know, Albert Breer wrote this piece, and I've, I've seen a couple of Denver writers read it as well, and talked to my guy James Palmer, like, the, the practice has been brutal. Camp has been brutal. Two and a half hour practices, a lot of running, like, we're, th- this, what happened last year, how we started last year? No, 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 not, we're not doing this. That's actually been kind of a trend this year, I think, if you in New England here, Mayo had them hitting, like, we haven't had hitting in practice in three, four years. You stole my final point. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I jumped ahead. Forget that I even said that. But I, so I think there's there's more of an attention to what they're doing and making sure that they don't go down that road again. And I feel like you know, Peyton is he's still a good coach. I don't know if he's a great coach. He's still a good coach. I think he'll be able to get some stuff. But then, I mean, how can you not go right to the quarterback room? I mean, someone did say this might be the most handsome quarterback room in NFL history, certainly this year, <laughs> Zach Wilson, Jared Stidham, Bo Nix. Appears that Zach is now on the outside looking in of the what was a three-man race. Now it's a two-man Shocker. race. They call Stidham steady, steady. Uh, he wasn't so steady when he was here, although I still think in 2020 the Patriots should have given him a chance over Cam Newton at some point. Um, and, the you know, he sort of organized some of their off-season stuff, had the receivers come down to his place in Texas and and work out and appears from all I can gather to have a much better grasp of the Peyton offense than he did a year ago. Peyton's always been kind of high on him, but you drafted Bo Nix 12, was it? Like he's playing at some point and it, it may be sooner rather than later. And what's the ceiling on that? What does the offense look like then? Because 
What I know about Stidham is he's got a pretty loose arm. It's a pretty good arm. His strength there. Bo doesn't feel like he has that same kind of arm. And I sort of wonder between maybe the arm talent limitations and then just being a rookie in this system, if we're not looking at an offense that's very similar to what he put together the last couple of years at Drew Brees when Drew couldn't throw the ball very much down the field. And that was all about, you know, timing and placement and everything was quick. Or even when Teddy Bridgewater came in and they had a nice little run with Teddy, but he managed the hell out of Teddy. Like same thing too. Like a lot of short stuff, play action. I mean, how many times can you run the stick route? Like how many, like they just, they out of a bunch of different formations, that's what they were doing. So does that sort of limit maybe their ability to make some plays down the field, which at least last year with Russell for all the things that Russell couldn't do, that's the one thing they did let him do. They didn't throw the short stuff. They were just like, huck it down the field. Like, get let Sutton go get it. Let Marvin Mims go get it. Uh, you know, they drafted Troy Franklin, who fell all the way into the fourth round. Um, he's one of those uh, skinny, fast guys that make me nervous. And I know we've had some good examples of that, but obviously we saw in this draft, Xavier Worthy, we're going to get to another one of those skinny fat. I don't, they're not my cup of tea necessarily. Uh, so I don't know if they're good enough there. Um, so I, I just, to your point too, defensively, that's where I feel like they've almost aged out. Like it's not, they don't have a good marriage of what they are defensively. You know, Sertain's a great player, although his numbers were a little bit diminished last year, if you kind of go deeper into it. But he's he's still one of the best corners in the league. But like, what else is there? What else is around him? I just Justin Simmons is still a good player. They cut him. He's making too much money. Like they just it feels like okay, maybe Sean can piece this together again, and maybe they can be a seven eight win team again. But like, again, that feels like that's the ceiling to me. It doesn't feel like there's another step for them to go with the roster the way it is right now. Yeah, they, they're in, there's a couple of things again that stand out. Like you, there again. This is it's not the same as the Raiders. I think this roster is deeper. It's not as as top heavy. But you know, I'll get to the quarterback in a second. But like, I liked a lot of what they did. You know, in in terms of bringing JFM on. You know, friend. You know, of a uh, former friend of my, yes. my other show, <laughs> and you know, for basically restructured his deal and get him on. You know, two years of really easy, good money. He's a good quality. You know, top twenty edge in the league in terms of like that bigger edge position and Sertan's obviously a stud and, you know, Baron Browning and, and Nick Benito, can you get, you know, 10 combined sacks out of those two? And, you know, you start to look around, Zach Allen's made some, that's done some nice stuff. The defense just kind of feels like it's going to be a lot of by committee and just kind of play really good sound football and maybe, and, and we'll see there. The, the thing where I struggle with the, the Broncos is this, is like, you got this great offensive mind in theory and Sean Payton. And again, it's hard to really judge fully any great offensive mind when the quarterbacks are, mm-hmm. are, are what they've been, but you know, they give Quinn Miners the big extension a couple of weeks ago feels felt like that was a bit of an overpay in my opinion, but again, we'll see, they still got to, you know, do something about the Garrett Bowles contract. They just, I'm, they give McGlinchey this big money deal and I'm not sure McGlinchey's, I, I just felt like that was kind of a we needed someone there yes. and we needed to give some solidity. He was the best Despite, tackle on the market. We paid him. That's that's yeah, that. just but, but it's also like he's not that I, guy. I, I, think, <laughs> I, know, I, not, I just watched the Jets do this with like a Tomlin similar. It's like he looks really good in a system with Kyle Shanahan and you know Trent Williams on the offensive line and all these guys. Receiver, right? They obviously move off of move off of Judy. Yep. That felt like that got really messy really quick. And yeah. and I don't blame Judy's really been a disappointing NFL player. I think his 100%. ceiling now is like a it's maybe a good two uh, in the right situation. Sudden, you know, still big playability. I think that's a really quality contract. He's a guy, if he gets traded middle of the season, do not be surprised. He has great value considering, again, affordable deal is a unique type of skill set. Um, Josh Reynolds, a guy, and, and him and Franklin, can they, you know, can they operate a little bit there? And, you know, can they be somewhat of a quality? You know, Troy Franklin I liked, but he's 165 pounds. Okay. And as you mentioned, some drops in there and on the Oregon tape. So it was a little bit too tough. He was a tough eval, uh, frankly, for me. Marvin Mims, an exciting player, potentially. Javante is the one that's kind of disappointing, right? I think, you know, you just look at some of these injuries and, you know, it wasn't this clean ACL or it wasn't, yeah. the, you know, the clean meniscus that you're back. And it's a pretty unique, it's, it was a unique knee injury and it, it sucks. He was such an awesome player, you know, in college and coming out. And then it's like, Will we ever going to see that again? If we see it, maybe it'll be this year. It's obviously mm-hmm. 12 plus months removed, but last year it just didn't have that same feel to it. And again, I, I'm not blaming him by any means. I just, yeah. it's, it's, it sucks. Cause if you, if Javante was 
what you would expect to have a free injury expected. Javante Sutton, Mims, Reynolds, Trey pretty Franklin, good little core. pretty yeah. decent, decent little core. And, you know, not going to blow the doors off anybody, but like, you feel like Sean Payton with those, that type of talent, like he could do some, some good stuff there. And again, I just, you got, you, t- you talked about the quarterback room. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how do you phrase this semi yeah how do i phrase this nicely like i yeah. i think stidham should probably be the starter based on like who gives you the best chance to win week mm-hmm. one but bo Nix is a really old prospect coming out that is tailor made for the sean and payton spread the ball around quick timing offense get the ball out of his hand do that different type of stuff so like he should play right away i just don't know as you mentioned if he really should play right away if you're trying to win right. but again you want to develop him at some level, I just don't know how much there is to develop. I kind of feel like he's going to come in and be like semi Mac Jones ish rookie year, where like it's a league average, solid quarterback, maybe a little bit above average, but how much left is there in the tank to get better? Um, I don't expect Zach Wilson to make the roster out of camp. And it's not because I'm just bitter Jets fan hating on Zach Wilson. Right. It's been pretty well documented out of camp. Any, everything you follow and everyone you talk to, like he's not getting any one's reps. The other two guys are. Zach was in the backup role last year. The offense has to be very specific for Zach. Sean Payton gave a very weird answer when asking about Zach being a guy with, you know, 40, 50 plus starts in the NFL, 40 plus starts in the NFL. He was like, yeah. And it was like, oh, <laughs> okay, man. Like that. So I think he he probably is the practice squad guy for them. And, you know, I, you don't blame them for taking a shot on him. It's sure. just the, the Broncos and the Raiders and Broncos feel a little different to me. I feel like the Broncos – ceiling is lower but so and their floor is a little bit higher in terms of just like you feel like sean payton you trust a little bit more bo nick should be solid at, at you know if he's if he's solid like are you a six to eight win team that can be frisky and competitive and Sertan makes some big plays and javante looks like himself or are you a, a pick, team picking the top five i feel like the, the raiders it's more of higher ceiling like, hey aiden o'connell's pretty competent and yeah. antonio pierce is better than we thought and these stars are just carrying us but also the Raiders, again, can pull off the cliff. So I think both these teams are, like, fighting for third place by a wide margin. And I don't even – I'm not even that high on the Chargers. But yeah, I, I just feel like too long – watch. I'm telling you, the Raiders will somehow beat the Chiefs early in the season. And, right. and the Broncos will go to and go beat, you know, beat the Jets in week four, and I'll be looking like an asshole. But for right now, <laughs> I think both those teams, unfortunately, and not to be negative, I just think they're probably two of the worst teams in the AFC. And they're – trying to figure out more Broncos specifically. Is this your franchise quarterback and and the Raiders specifically? Is this your franchise head coach moving forward? Can we build around this core of Crosby Pierce and so on and so forth? One guy I want to mention before we move on to the chargers, Audric Estime running back from yes. Notre Dame, who's opened a lot of eyes in camp uh, about 227 pounds. I, I really liked his tape coming out. He didn't run very well and it, it caused him to end up falling into the fifth round. Um, if Javante Williams can't rediscover the form, I feel like Estime is going to get a lot of cracks at that, and I think he's going to be a good player for them. So he, that's just one to watch, uh, and uh, maybe a deep fantasy football tip. You know, you're, you're looking for a, a running back to stash. He might be the guy. Getting on the excitement, it went up to $100 cash. With prize picks, you can earn, turn $10 into 1000 while watching Team USA rack up the gold medals this summer. You can make prize pick lineups of players across basketball, soccer, tennis, golf, and more in as little as 60 seconds. Just pick more or less than two to six stat projections, and you're locked in. If you're looking for promotions, Prize Picks has got you covered every week. From lowering select player stats projections on Tuesdays to help your lineup hit, or getting entry fees back if you have a losing lineup on Fridays. Mike, I know you uh, you know like to dabble in these apps. Yes. Um, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, hey, look, like I'm so look as we know we talked about this. You're a Yankee fan. I'm a Red Sox fan. I, it's it's easy to be a Red Sox fan now that I don't have to cover them because covering them was a pain in the butt. Yeah, I'm enjoying this playoff push, and I pretty much. I have a love affair with Raphael Devers. So, like, I look at his numbers every day. Download the Prize Pick app today. Use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. It's like it's for free money. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Uh, we go to the Chargers, who were 5 and 12 last year. Blew it all up, right? Harbaugh is the head coach now. We know his ability to, especially early, impact programs, and he's he's like a nut. I mean, <laughs> you you read all the stuff. Uh, his energy is off the charts. He's out there, you know, running around with the guys, like really pushing them. 
I think they needed it. I think they've been sort of, there's been a fair amount of talent there that's been wasted over the last few years, unfortunately for them now. They either had to let go some of that talent or some of that talent's on the last legs. Um, so I don't know how quickly he turns this around because I think had they been able to kind of keep some of those pieces together, that maybe there was a chance for a bigger pop. But now you have the Justin Herbert injury on top of it. He's allegedly going to be ready for week one, but that's a lot of time missed in a brand new offense for him. So that's that's a problem. It may get them off to a, a slower start than they want. And I guess to me, they're an interesting team because, again, the Harbaugh, the Harbaugh factor – could make them significantly better than I think they could be just because he has that ability. He did it in San Francisco. He's obviously done it. Every stop that he's been, he gets it. They get a big push from him. It's the interim head coach push, but it, it, it's continued with him, unlike some of the interim head coaches. But I think the roster is kind of a mess, you know, like I, just the other day, right? Bosa goes down with an injury. Well, are you surprised? What does Joey Bosa do? Joey Bosa gets hurt. Terrific player when he's on the field, but he's always hurt. You know, they rework Max deal. And he had a ton of sacks last year. But then when you start analyzing the sacks, six sacks in that one game against Aiden O'Connell, he got Zach a couple times, didn't he? Like, there's – he fattened up on some bad teams. So you can't take it away from him. You do – you play against who you play against. Yeah. But is he that guy anymore? Obviously, they didn't think so. They reworked his deal. They reworked Bosa's deal. And then they let Keenan Allen and Mike Williams go. Mike Williams, fine. I know he just got activated off the PUP. But obviously, someone hadn't played a ton of games for them. But Keenan's obviously been a, a terrific receiver. Then still has some juice. Still, uh, still kind of a one of the better guys in the league. And they had to let him go because of the contract. And now, who you don't have Justin Herbert out there here during training camp? And who the hell is he throwing to? Lad yeah. McConkey, J- Josh Palmer. Like that. That's that's a thin group. That's last year with the Patriots. That wide receiver room was about as bad as it can get, and performed about that way. This room could be worse. Yeah, there, there's a couple of things. I always say that. Right, there's always a couple of things. But uh, a I'll couple start two, the, couple two, three things. Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll start defensively, you know, as you did. I think similar to the Broncos, and again, the Chargers never quite got the, the chemistry and formula right, but they had these stars on defense, and you feel like they missed the window with this elite-level defense or defensive players, I, sh- I should say. Obviously, the, Denver- the Staley era was a complete disaster. It was a disaster, but it was like the names on paper. You're like, if there's a yes. legitimate coach in here, they should be really good. And, you know, obviously, again, I mentioned in Denver, like it was more about the Fangio kind of started that, and they had all these great guys, and they were awesome in defense every year, and they were like, they just get a quarterback, and obviously it didn't work. The Chargers thing is weird. So I like Asante Samuel Jr., Mm-hmm. I don't love him, but I think he's a solid player. Yeah, good player. You know, Gotten like better every ju- year. Ju- Junior Colson coming out this year. I, I like the move. Bosa and Morgan Fox and, you know, Puna Ford and, and obviously Cleo Mack on paper should be more than a good enough unit. But again, Mack last year, I think he had 17 sacks in eight of his games and nine games without a sack. Like mm-hmm. sometimes it's not as like you kind of want the guy that just gets a half a sack to a sack a game as opposed to, you know, fattening up, as you mentioned, on some kind of inferior competition. The Derwin James thing is kind of the key for me. I am slightly worried watching Derwin James tape the last two years, not just last year. I don't know. I, I don't know if he's still the same player he was where he was just this unicorn dominant player. And it feels like now every time you watch him, it's like, when's he going to get a 15 yard penalty for just trying right. to take someone's head off? They're awesome to watch. They're great hits. And in the 2000, early 2000s, Derwin James would even be still look, like, you know, look awesome with that. But I just, I slightly worry he's not quite as dynamic and quite as unique of a player as he once was. Not that he's not awesome still, but like, is he game changing, can change this defense from into a top 15 unit? to make sure the offense can well, maybe around yeah. Harbaugh, maybe well, that's how he was built. Right. And that's what he was in the beginning before the injury. I'm, you know, look, he, he's had a couple bad injuries and that's, that's difficult. And maybe this is the year now that you're one year further away from all the rehab. Sometimes we see that like, I mean, it take, you know, you say it takes a year. Sometimes it takes two just because you've been in that cycle, but he was someone who obviously they could utilize in so many different ways. Yeah. And, and, the unicorn is I, I, the word gets thrown around a lot, but he he was and he, he got was, paid. Yeah. He got paid like that, but it hasn't been the same. And if he's not the same, you know, yeah. If you're going to get eight games out of Joey Bosa, twelve and a half out of Cleo Mack, and Derwin James is not going to be full Derwin James. Like that's that's the concerning part. Again, you trust Harbaugh in this unit to get them coached up. Um, 
I, I love the Cam Hart pickup. I think Cam Hart was one of my favorite guys in, in this, this draft class. I bet you he's, if not their best corner, their second best corner quite quickly. Uh, this year, I think he's a guy who's just NFL ready to play. So he's a guy Love that his like, physicality. He's yeah. super physical. I think he's yep. going to come in and be a good player right away. The offensive side of the football is extremely – it's very unique to what we've talked about thus far. I think their offensive line is going to be – Oh, should be I don't awesome. even know. If, I you can bleep this out. Their <laughs> offensive line is going to be fucking awesome. Like <laughs> Joe Alt and Slater and you know and, and Bozeman and Zion and all. And I'm like, geez, man, like Harbaugh with this kind of this talent up front, you're like, dude, this should be awesome. Yes, like this should be really awesome with an elite, elite top five. We'll talk about Herbert a little bit more in depth before we wrap up the Chargers. But like, this should be awesome. This should be very Lions ish. You know, those first couple of years, even last year with Goff or and, and Hurts in Philadelphia, like that should be this level of a good offensive line. Like they could have gone and went Malik neighbors. They could have done the convenient like thing. And they went, we're going to build this thing, the Harbaugh, Michigan. Like that's what when Niners, you know, back in the day kind of way. So that part's awesome. Like I am super excited to watch them. I love Lad McConkey. We, we sat together for, yep. for three da- days down in Mobile. And, you know, even the Florida State touchdown McConkey had, you know, in the bowl game and stuff like that. Like, all that's really exciting. I, I'm not taking anything away from McConkie's going to be a good player. I think the expectation is going to be Cooper Cup right away. Right. Maybe let's back off on that a little bit. Um, Josh Palmer, decent player. Brennan Rice, you know, getting him that late was a joke. Like, again, yeah. should contribute day one. The biggest X factor of this team is Quentin Johnson is a first round pick who might suck. Yes. <laughs> And I had Chargers people liking a tweet I had when he, he had touchdown <laughs> against Michigan. I had said Quentin Johnson's good. Obviously, I I was wrong. Um, <laughs> but I, it was it. He had a very tough year. He had a very tough year. The hands don't look natural. The separation is yeah. not great. All that stuff. If he can somehow figure it out and just be a quality high end three, low end two, I know it's not what you want in a sense. But can McConkey, him, and Josh Palmer be the combined of like? one and a half good receivers in the next mm-hmm. off season, when you have some more money and, and a pick, you could go take another guy. That's the biggest X factor because we, this is the first time on the pod we've talked about a team that has an elite, elite level quarterback. And I think the Herbert discussion is so tiring. And I, I think it's probably my least favorite discussion in the NFL. And it's been for that for a while. I think the Burrow Allen thing is a little tiring. You know, most Mahomes the best is Rogers wash. All that stuff. It's like, pretty normal you know is too a good all that stuff the herbert one's weird because he was so awesome as a rookie and i was so right on justin herbert coming mm-hmm. out of college and that but also part of the problem was is i wasn't as right on justin herbert because he hasn't really gotten that much better he was better right. he's gotten better but it doesn't feel like he's taken that leap in the like he's threatening mahomes level it kind of feels like he's gotten surpassed in a sense surpassed quote unquote by Allen and burrow and he's more mm-hmm. in that dak you know that number four, five, is he better than Stroud? Is he not better than Stroud? Like that kind of range, which is still awesome. I, I said it to some Chargers people that, you know, talking to some Chargers people in their front office and things like that of, you know, you guys kind of have the easy part. Think you have the GM. Think you have the coach. I definitely know you have the coach and I know you have the quarterback and you got some young pieces on both sides of the ball. Their core is extremely exciting I just don't know if you're not going to get fully locked in Herbert in terms of health and these other things, and you don't get a step and all struggles a little bit in the beginning or Quentin Johnson's not as good or the defense gets hurt. Now you're probably a scrappy seven win team. Whereas why can't the chargers win 10 games? If they get like, if everyone else around them, Derwin's Derwin and Bosa, you get 14 games and Herbert's awesome. They're probably a nine or 10 win team. Like yeah, they have every capability. That's why they're just frustrating because if you pick, if you see people pick them as a wild card team, I could see it, mm-hmm. but I also could tell you that they could also pick in the top ten next year. And Harbaugh is like, I need another year. Right. Well, I, I, I'm curious. You you bring up the Herbert thing, and I think it's a good point about what the expectations were for him once we saw him as a rookie, and thinking that automatically, like I remember then, he's a top five quarterback. Like that was like an immediate reaction to after his rookie year that's what he was going to be and that's he was going to insert himself into that conversation and maybe one day wrestle the the, the belt away from Rodgers or Mahomes I don't you or, feel like people get sick of it's the excuses thing that I think is what people struggle with it's injuries it's the coach it's this mm-hmm. now you've not really a lot of well, he's hurt again but <laughs> yeah well and so and that's a massive problem I think the other thing like looking back at last year 
a lot of opportunities late in games to bring that team to either the tying score or the winning score and didn't do it. It was like, I think I want to say I counted five last yeah, year. It's, where, it was not a winning time quarterback last no, year. No, and sure. that's like, look, if you're going to pay the guy that much and it's all built around him, if he can't deliver in those moments, okay, you bring in Harbaugh, you're going to be more physical, you're going to run the ball more. We'll see how that plays out over the course of a 17-game season and whether their offense, the defense can complement the offense enough to allow them to be in games that are maybe 21-17, 24-21, as opposed to what we see in the league a lot of, which is, you know, high 20s and 30s. Um, But now I'm I'm curious about their relationship because while Harbaugh's done a nice job of getting guys, you know, proved Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick, obviously – his development in college, J.J. McCarthy, there's a long, there's a big window in there where he didn't do a good job developing quarterbacks, couldn't find the quarterbacks, couldn't get on the same page with the quarterbacks. And quite frankly, in college, they got to get on the same page as him. But now we're at the point where, okay, you may be, we gave you the keys and you're making a lot of money, Harbaugh, but we're paying Herbert a hell of a lot more. So he's still got some, some more juice there. And I'm curious what that relationship is going to be like because Harbaugh won't be easy on his quarterbacks. Justin has that reputation of being sort of a laid back dude. How's it going to be when Harbaugh's in his face, you know, not just during practice and film sessions, but during a game day when he does something he doesn't like and, or Hey, Herbert wants to throw the ball and I keep handing it off. I keep handing it off. And we're, you know, we keep putting ourselves behind the chains because this is the way and the style that you want to play. So that's part of it. You know, like we, the big story just came out uh, this week about Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni and their relationship and how much it cooled between the Super Bowl season and this past season, in fact, there was a lot of friction there between the two guys and maybe still some friction there that needs to be sorted out for, again, that's a team that has in their mind, a Super Bowl roster and Super Bowl aspirations. So those sorts of things can submerge you or if they get on the same page and he can get the max out of Herbert and get a tough guy Herbert in there and elevate him, then yeah, your point of 10 wins, that's, that's a real possibility. But that's it's going to be one to watch. I'm curious. I'm I'm going to be talking to a lot of Chargers people during the course of the year because I really want to see how that relationship plays out. Yeah, it's just it's just hard. It's like you look at 2020, obviously COVID year, but like 30 plus touchdowns, yeah. 4,000 plus yards. Gets you know has a great year in 21, like the 5,000 yards, 38 touchdowns. You know, is obviously a Pro Bowler and all that stuff. Top 10 finisher in MVP 2022 then the playoff loss happens and it's not all on Justin Herbert, but at the end of the day, like Trevor Lawrence was terrible in that game for a half, like generationally bad, yep. but they ended up winning that game. And now Trevor Lawrence is like, well, he won a playoff game. And like, they, <laughs> right. almost, they were competitive with the chiefs and see like, this is why Lawrence you buy into Lawrence. Whereas Herbert, you could use it as a reason not to buy into him. And then last year again, has the injury. I only got to see him once in person last year when it was against the jets. And I thought he was frankly horrible, but it, it also is, I still think he's a top five guy. And I still think like he should take that next step in terms of Harbaugh should have Brand Staley was such a bad coach that you can't convince me. They're not at least two or three wins better just on the fact of like not having to have Brandon Staley and having Jim Harbaugh. And then again, if Herbert's, you know, somewhat healthy and behind this offensive line, again, they've, this thing, it should look pretty damn good mm-hmm. pretty quickly. Even without the elite weapons, can they just, you know, they lose Eckler, but like, I don't know, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's going to force Herbert to like, not just like check the ball down to Eckler for, for 12 to 15, you know, targets a game. The running back room with the chargers is one that like, doesn't really excite you. It's Gus Edwards and JK Dobbins and stuff. But again, I don't know that they're going to be a team. They've never really been, you know, I guess with Frank Gore, Harbaugh was like that, but it's always been three, four guys and Mm -hmm. they kind of cycle through. So again, I think the chargers are the team that they should finish second. We should feel, I think we should be leaving 24 going, a receiver, one or two pieces on defense, and one more year of Harbaugh, and they're like competing with Kansas City for that division title. Like that's where I feel like they should be leaving. If you leave, kind of questioning Harbaugh a little, uh, questioning Herbert a little bit, and man, this roster is not that good. Like that's that would be pretty frustrating if I'm a Chargers fan. Well, you could be in a scenario where Bosa's gone after next year, Max gone after next year, like Derwin. Like if it, if if they don't see the real Derwin, like. Harbaugh will make that hard decision. Um, but then you're talking about a real roster reset on de- on defense. All right, let's go to the uh, the reigning champs. 11 and 6 last year. Uh, you know, I, as I was kind of looking at their season and, and going over some numbers, 
it just and and we obviously talked about it quite a bit last year just anyone who covered the league like they didn't look anything like they did in 2019 20 21 22 like that that was a it's a different looking offense it was a struggle i mean the the game against the raiders it was like oh they're are they dead and then of course they reinvent themselves yeah uh and and Maybe they were playing a little bit of possum with Kelsey just in terms of how they use him and trying to buy him some more snaps when it really mattered in January and uh, February when, of course, he was excellent. But just look at their playoff run. Bills miss a makeable field goal in that game. The next week, Lamar, just MVP Lamar, would look like some of the things that we've talked about with Lamar in the postseason. It just kind of puked on his shoes a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and that was a ba- that for me was, I mean, a gritty win for KC, but a bad loss for Baltimore. And then, hey, look what happens in the Super Bowl. Kyle Shanahan and the Niners have a lead in the fourth quarter, and they can't hang on to it. That's uh, that happened to him the last time against KC when Jimmy was the quarterback. That happened when, of course, he was the OC in Atlanta, and we know the twenty-eight to three against the Patriots are not able to hold on there. But like they had a lot go their way last year. So while I give them credit for, for finding ways to win, there was also uh, – they, they had a lot of luck. There's a, I, luck is part like you're in good position to be yeah. there, but like there's a lot of things that went their way in the postseason to allow them to win a Super Bowl. And uh, I wonder, can, that, can the same thing happen again? Because while I think they've made some upgrades at certain spots, they've also – they've lost some key guys. Legereus Sneed was a huge player for them. His ability at corner obviously got paid a ton of money by the Titans. I think he's I think he's worth it. Um, but that means Trent McDuffie has to be the number one. Trent was an all pro last year. Phenomenal. But he was a largely a slot corner. And now he's going to have to play more outside because Legereus was that guy and he's not going to be there. So I just think there's a lot of things happening with that team where we can look at it and say, Andy's a great coach and we know Patrick's the best. And Kelsey, you know, he's getting older. He's slowing down. But, the, you know, he still has big moments left in him. But can they kind of cobble some of these pieces together and have the the sort of fortune that they had last year? Um, you know, they had a ton of drops last year. And so they went out and they said, all right, we're going to draft Xavier Worthy in the first round. Well, as I mentioned, <laughs> as we were talking about Troy Franklin, I have a real – those guys freak me out. And I think the track record, like some people said that Jalen Waddle was that guy, like skinny, fast guy. Jalen Waddle's got a little bit more to him. He's a 200-pound guy. Where are these 165 pounds? Yeah. And you saw the viral clip of him getting destroyed in practice on the jam where he like literally went flying about five yards in the air. And then you see the clips where he's running by dudes. And I think you're probably, I mean, there are going to be moments like that. I think we're obviously they're looking to unlock the outer portions of the field, which they could not do last year. And then maybe he can give them that, but that's again, asking a lot of 165 pound rookie. Can he last 17 games or play 14 or 15 games and then be be prime worthy in the postseason can you can you count on that kind of player so i just think it's a they're they're a really good team they're going to be in the mix but i i have a lot of questions about them as well yeah look i think they're in some ways and i'll use a baseball reference here they kind of feel there's like 2000 2005 ish yankees where it felt like somehow or 2002 i guess is probably a better example like when they lose to the angels like winning year after year luck's kind of going their way they've got some injury luck some of these guys are starting to get older the core is still amazing they still have some of the best players in the sport but it feels like and they've got the the manager the coach the g everything is locked in and like no doubt they're gonna go win in 2002 and then okay of course they go back in you know 2002 2004 we all know the story yankee socks but like it just felt like that team didn't have kind of got over the hump in 2000, 2001. They really struggled and, and stuff like that. So do I think the Chiefs are should be the favorite? Yeah, they should because mm-hmm. they have the best player in the sport. They probably have the best coach, if not one of the three or four best coaches. Yep. I want to start one thing before I kind of just look at the roster. The Chiefs had a horrible offseason, and, and I – I don't think anyone's talked about it enough and, and I'll do it and I'll make enemies of Chiefs fans, I guess, you know, the pod too, but they get a lot of credit for doing a lot of things right as they should. The amount of arrests and bad things and their she rice thing. Like I feel like at some point we're going to need to like, be like, Hey man, like this has got to stop whatever's going on. And it's a lot of, you know, bottom of the roster guys. So it doesn't really get talked about other than rice. And a lot of them are stuff that I don't really know too much detail into the crime other than what Schefter reports and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, it was a really rough off season for them. And I 
just wonder like, is that a th- sign of things to come that they're going to start to, you know, the locker room kind of, you lose it a little bit and he's been around a really long time and he's amazing, but it's like, he's not a superhuman. Like he, <laughs> at some right. point people just kind of walk in there, especially some of these younger guys and bottom of the roster guys, you should come in and it's like, Oh, our Pat will fix it and stuff. And you just worry, just have like a, I just wanted to mention that because I feel like it was, it was tough. It was tough to read every, every three days. It's another arrest for a chiefs player. All that said, they're the defending champs. They have they still have one of the best tight ends in football. They have the best player and best quarterback in the sport. They have a really, really damn good defense. They have one of the best defensive coordinators. They have mm-hmm. one of the best home field advantages. They have one of the best ref advantages. If you're not a Chiefs fan, you know, so there's a lot to be like really excited about. I just, you covered those Pats teams with Brady and like, it's going to take Mahomes kind of pulling everyone, pulling everyone up. Cause like, just because Pat was in the debate for the GOAT and all these different things doesn't mean all these other guys that just won a title the last couple of years are like, all right, I've got paid and I got this. I, think, I don't know. I'm not like 100% locked in. Again, I'm not trying to like poo-poo the Chiefs at all. Mm-hmm. Just Again, they're still the favorite. Like I could not say enough good things about all these other things. I just wanted to mention those couple of things because when you worry about these dynasties kind of having a, a rough go of it and the luck not turning their way, things like a ton of arrests during the offseason or – hey, these guys didn't come in fully in shape because they'll just assume Pat will fix the problems or just things I want to mention. Anything on that, and then I'll just hit the roster quickly. Well, I, it, I think Andy in particular, the framework they've had, they've always taken chance on on guys that other teams – I mean, Rasheed Rice was off some teams' boards for character concerns. Yep. And then you see the multiple arrests and the things that have happened. And obviously, I, I'd be stunned if he doesn't get a couple-game suspension for what happened this offseason. Hasn't, he's – saying I'm not talking about it, whatever. I'm just trying to be the best Rasheed Rice I can be. Well, that's great. He's saying all the right things, but you've screwed up multiple times. You screwed up at SMU. You're screwing up here. He's an important piece for them. And he, by all accounts, he looks awesome in camp. Like, of course he does. He's a great yeah, he's. I mean, he's physically gifted. Last year, his route tree was very limited, right? It was a lot of throws close to the line of scrimmage and then let his athletic ability as a run after catch take over. They've expanded that a little bit, and if he can become that player, I mean, that's scary. Because, yeah. as I mentioned, Worthy Speed will play. I just don't know how long it'll play for. Um, yeah. Opens up space for Kelsey. They continue to do that, like I was mentioning about Kelsey and how they used him. Saw a lot of the other two tight ends last year. Oh yeah, big time. taking him off the field. And we're not, you know what? You're not. We're not sticking you in in line and having you block an edge player or a big you know, crack down on a defensive tackle or deal with some rambunctious linebacker that wants to take your head off. Like we're going to try to manage that load on you. And I think they have to, he's definitely slowed down a little bit for sure. Um, And you saw some of the drops during the regular season. We always see that with older players or someone like, you know, Juju Smith Schuster locally he's 27, but his legs are gone. He's dropping a lot of balls in camp and it's because, the legs aren't what they used to be, and then that starts to impact everything else. It's a, famous, saw- it's a famous Bill Simmons quote. I think it's probably the best Simmons quote of all time was, like, with Gronk, it's like he had, you know, it's a 1980 or whatever, pick your pick your muscle car from the 70s or 80s that's got, like, when it's going, it's it's still got its, its fastball, yeah. but it's got, like, 50 miles in it, and it's like, how do you get <laughs> 50 miles out of 20 games if you're the yes. Chiefs? Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is, like, you mentioned McDuffie. The way they've drafted, as much as I just said, you know, I was negative, I guess, to start with the Chiefs. Well, it's a fair – look, there's good and bad to all this. We're talking about the Chiefs and people are like, you're down – you know, like, who are you saying all these negative things about the Chiefs? I think we both would agree if I had to put money down right now, I'd I'd probably put it on the Chiefs, you know. But, like, this is – I say this all the time and it happens in Boston. There's been a lot of pushback over the the course of that dynasty, the, the double dynasty, if you will. Like, they got to a point where they were so good that what you do is you sit there and you look at their flaws and say, is that something that comes back to bite them in the big games in January and February? Like that literally is how you, and I think that's how you have to look at the chiefs. Like is their left tackle situation going to be good enough so that when they get to January and February, Patrick is protected. Cause we saw what happened when they had the injuries in the, the Super Bowl in the COVID year. They, I mean, Mahomes was the, he's the great quarterback couldn't do anything in that game because he was thrown yeah. from his back or he landing on his back over and over again. Um, so that's, I think, kind of how you have to look at it. But you were, you were mentioning McDuffie and the way they've drafted. Yeah, no, I just, I they've drafted, no, they drafted so well on defense and developed so well. And even, you know, Leo Chanel or Nick Bolton and how good these guys Love are. Nick Chris, Chris yep. Jones, obviously one of the seven or eight best defensive players in the league, yep. if not better. And Carl Loftus, Loftus, Loftus yep. took a nice step. And, yep. 
Brian Cook took a step last year. And, you know, and Justin Reed's obviously a good player. They obviously add Matt Arise on the roster and they extend Bucker. So that special teams room's got some of its own interesting little quirks, depending <laughs> yes. on, you know, political beliefs. And yes. we, beliefs we don't do and, politics here, but yes. Not, you know, there's just a lot there. And, <laughs> yeah. and Pacheco, Pacheco's a hard runner and mm-hmm. it's crazy that, you know, they could survive. They, you know, Keontae Ingram I liked, you know, back in college. And like uh, Kingsley Sumatio is a guy that I think a lot of teams liked, you know, on their board. Mm-hmm. It all comes down to like, Mahomes was not his best Mahomes last year by any means. That said, he still has that superpower that we've seen very few quarterbacks ever have. If only really one other one, maybe you can you know argue a few other ones in there back from you know pre uh, HD TV days. But <laughs> you know, I, I just I still look at the Chiefs and you feel like they should still win probably twelve games and win this division quite comfortably and. They'll host a playoff game. They'll probably be the two or the one seed. And we'll be having the same conversation. I just, I feel like everyone says, oh, this is the year it doesn't happen. The only thing I'm kind of, my expectations are slightly tempered with them is they have, they've become less dominant and they become more of a, you know, they shifted. That's again, we talked about the Brady chiefs I mean the Brady Pats, but like they shifted in this, from this defensive team to putting it more on Brady. And then it kind of went back to the other way. And then it kind of shifted, like it shifts. This is what happens. I just, they're going to have to get as much as they can out of Kelsey without burning him out. And they're going to have to get, stay healthy offensive line wise. Obviously you got to keep Pat healthy. And then defensively, they're going to have to suffocate teams. And I think they're going to win a lot more games, 24, 16, 23, mm-hmm. 10, than they are going to be the chiefs of the first two Pat years where it was like, Oh, they're going to beat you 45, to, you know, 45, 41. Like that's not where we're looking. It's kind of the opposite. They're probably still going to win the super bowl or at least win the AFC. But again, I don't think it's going to be, going to be a lot more like last year where it's a little bit of a grind a little bit more of a methodical high quality well-rounded roster as opposed to this like superstar kelsey kelsey tyreek and mahomes throwing it all over the yard well i mean so they they clearly with the worthy addition they're trying as i mentioned they're trying to attack more down the field and get more consistency out of it so in a perfect world rice does take that step that, that he's shown here in training camp and stays out of trouble Worthy gives you a bunch of big plays. Like I don't, I'm not saying he's catching 70 balls, but what if he catches 40 for 800 yards or 750 yards and five, 60, you know, big plays there, 40 plus yard plays, which is, you know, obviously his speed allows him to be capable of. And then Suma Suma Matia, who's in competition with Morris at left. Hopefully, I said that right. I, have I think no yeah, I, I I had to I I I sort of got it because I thought the Patriots might select him. You know, he's a little bit of a he's a, he's raw but really physically talented. And I think he's going to be the left tackle at some point, whether he starts the year as the, as the starting left tackle or not, I don't know. But like, if he can be solid on the left side, you look at their interior three. It's awesome. I mean, Tooney obviously coming back from an injury, but still playing at a high level. Creed Humphreys, someone who's going to have to think about paying in the, I'm sure they will try to pay him in the off season, pay him in the off season. And Trey Smith at right guard, like that's as good of an interior three as you can have in the league. Um, even, you know, we talk about the Chargers offensive line, like their interior three is not as good as that interior three when, no. they, when those guys are firing. So like they have the potential to do those things. And then you mentioned Spags and passing. They were seventh in, in defensive DVOA last year. And then obviously sort of a masterclass um, in the postseason. And I mean, it was a love affair for him at the Super Bowl. I don't know that I've ever seen that for an assistant coach or it's been a mighty long time. And I, can say <laughs> he deserved every bit of it. Like he got that group. He's such a master at sort of evolving as the year goes on. He, I think he's a great teacher. So I think you, as you saw with the, the young players, the number of young players that they've integrated into that group and have gotten good play and, and improvement from is, is pretty impressive. So like, I trust that guy, you know, he, obviously it didn't work for him as a head coach, although he was thrust in a terrible situation and if, but if being the best defensive coordinator in football uh, for the last however many years, or being one of them and continuing to do that for a few more, that's a that's a pretty good resume to have. And he's a massive piece. Like I, I look at him, like the Josh McDaniels, the same thing. Didn't work out as a as the offensive coordinator as a head coach, but as a coordinator when he had and then, look he had Brady, but like that allowed Bill to just I don't I'm not worried about that. He Bill would yeah. turn his back on the offense while they were on the field in important games to go send a message to the defense about this, that, and the other thing, or coach up a positional player. That's what 
Andy has. Andy doesn't have to worry about the defense. Not at all. You're like, you, I'm, I'm over here. I'm in the lab. I'm cooking up plays. I'm talking to Pat. We're crafting an offense here. We're, we're making adjustments in game because I know you're doing the same thing on defense, and I have the utmost faith in you. This isn't Kyle Shanahan overriding Steve Wilkes last year for blitzing too much, and obviously Steve Wilkes was out after one year as the defense coordinator with San Fran. Like, this is just like the ultimate in trust, and that matters so much, especially in those big games where, like, man, I can sit here and grind on offense. I just don't have to worry about that part of because he's got it. He's got yeah. it, and I trust him, and, and he has the resume and the big game performances to back it up. Yeah, look, I, I – I just I think this division finishes KC, Chargers, Raiders, and Broncos. Raiders and Broncos, you could flip flop either way. Obviously, it depends on quarterback and some other things like that. I wanted to mention one thing here. I know we're we finished up the AC West here. Connor Hughes had an interesting report. We talked about Hassan Reddick last time, mm-hmm. uh, last episode. Mm-hmm. Reddick's been fined one point. He's already been fined one point two million by the it's Jets for not yeah. being there. Um, if he misses, you know, through Saturday, uh, we can talk about this a little bit more on, on Friday's episode, but. He will have now been fined $2.1 million um, for sitting out. And, you know, as much money as he'll recoup and get repaid there, that raise was probably going to be like six or seven million bucks after tax. Like he's looking at like a $2 million raise here um, after all these fines. So just something to mention there. Um, And obviously, again, if IUK or anything happens before, uh, you know, before we hop back on on the sticks on Friday, maybe we'll move up the recording or, or something like that. But you know, obviously fun getting our first division preview in here. Um, we'll, we'll kind of tease out, you know, what we're doing next. We'll probably do NFC West next, I'm assuming. Yeah. I think we'll, t- we'll take the West Coast. We'll finish up in our backyards. But <laughs> I'm looking forward to the NFC West. I think it's one of the most fun divisions every year. I great coaches, too. great brands of football, fun quarterbacks, et cetera. Um, Chiefs fans, I think you're going to win the division and probably win the AFC. I, I just had to mention, you know, a little bit of a little bit of a rough off season, but hey, you know, that's uh, that's what good organizations do. They figure it out, and uh, the Chiefs uh, certainly seem to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to on this one thing. If you made it this far, thank you very much. Like, subscribe, leave a review. That helps so much. Uh, you know, as we sort of build the pot here. Again, this is just episode two. We plan on doing this for a long time, and we hope we uh, entertain and inform you along the way. And I do want to shout out, if you made it to this point and you have a dog, I have a dog, he's a rescue, his name is Dougie, came pre-named, he's about a year, year and a half old, came from Alabama, Dougie's a crazy dog, he's a mix of a lot of different things. Dougie likes to eat bees, people, and he's allergic to bees. I don't know if you have any secrets of how, if you have a dog that's crazy like that and eats bees and then gets stung and then swells up like a balloon, uh, if you have any secrets... Send them to me because um, I'm at my wits end with this dog. Uh, I love him, but he is a nut. And I, what are you going to eat the bee for? You keep eating the bees, you eat the bees, you swell up. You like a big balloon. I don't know. Just leaving that out there. Leaving it out there for the folks at home. (laughs) No, make sure you guys like, like, subscribe, you know, rate, review all the whole nine yards. Appreciate everybody that's been doing so, so far. We're looking forward to uh, continue to do this thing. And NFC West, more Ayuk, more Reddick. Uh, lots more Judon, you know, yeah. uh, you know, on, on following upset on Friday. And we got some some more preseason football here coming up. Appreciate everybody for listening. We'll talk to you guys next week.